Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I love it, man. Well, uh, well, welcome to the show anyway. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. So, I've, on this show, I've interviewed like millionaire businessmen, authors, actors, but never interviewed an Olympian, which is something I've been quite fascinated by because they say it's like a one in a half million chance to become an Olympian, which tells oh, wow. me that it must require something that the rest of us don't have mentally. So what I wanted to ask is what mental traits have you noticed that Olympians share? Um... Uh, well, I think I think it's just it's just, uh, I can only, I can only talk for myself. I can't talk about other people because obviously I've like, everybody else have their own journeys and their own careers and stuff. Um, I'd like to think there's and this is going to sound really arrogant and hopefully we'll talk more about me and my career later on. People will hear me hear what I've got to say and will realise that it's not quite as arrogant as as. as as it seems without any background knowledge of me, but I think there's Olympians, Olympic medalists, whatever. And then there's me, like not in my own like stratosphere, but I think I'm separate to that because I had so much, like I faced so much adversity along the way. And I've, I've sat and had dinner and, and, and been at functions of other Olympians and stuff. And we're all kind of telling our story. And I tell my story and all those guys, like Olympic gold medalists, silver bronze medalists, sitting there with their mouths on the floor looking at me going wow like you went through that you know we th i thought my journey was hard and you had to come through all that stuff and so point i'm making is i think so i can only talk for myself and i think what i think to become successful in anything whether it's an author or, or a businessman or anything you've got like a, a really strong like a really strong um level of drive and determination and an ability to so when you fall over, which of course you're going to fall over, you're going to suffer setbacks. When you suffer setbacks, you don't like. For myself, I've, I've suffered loads of setbacks in my career, in my life. Not once have I ever thought, "Oh, should I quit? Oh, should I give up? This isn't meant to be." Every single time I've got up, I've dusted myself off, and I've gone again with even more, even more infused, even with even more drive and determination. So I think that's it, really. I think that's that's the main thing. I Obviously, to begin an Olymp Olympian, you have to be like physically um, good. <laughs> you need to be a certain level of athleticism. But on top of that, I think the mental drive, like the, the drive and determination to kind of keep getting up and keep training, training early in the morning, late at night. If you're in a weight category sport like my, like like boxing, you got to make weight no matter what. You got to miss nights out with your friends. You got to miss birthday parties. You got to miss like having cake, like small trivial things. But things that like when you're a teenager and you're a young man, you want to go out and have a beer with your friends and and watch football. You got to do that stuff in abundance, really. So, yeah, I think yeah, for, for, for the third time, <laughs> to be successful as an Olympian, you need a a real resolute mindset, strong and determined. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that people don't realise is that is that level of sacrifice, and not just in in sports, but in anything really. They they see the glory and they see how nice that be, but they don't see you know all the late nights, all the things that you miss out on, all the birthdays, all the parties, things like that. Yeah, hundred percent. Like Tyson Fury, I wouldn't say he's a mate of mine because I haven't I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but we trained together um, from. 16 years old to, to 19 on the Great Britain team together. Um, we obviously on the on, on the on the boxing circuit. We see we see each other quite a bit, or used to when I when I used to fight. And people see him now earning like ridiculous amounts of money. Like now, like fighting John Tay Wilder and, and whatnot. People, but people don't see the hours and hours and hours and hours of hours of training beforehand. People don't see, because people will say he's earned 20 million in one fight. Yeah, kind of, in one perspective, but that's the combination of years of hard work and years of training and years of sacrifice and years of doing the things that other people don't want to do. That's when you're doing them. And um, we might, we might touch upon it later on. I'm not too sure where you want this conversation to go, but I've done, I'm now embarking on a whole new career. My boxing career got cut short because of injury. I've, I'm now a professional wrestler, and I've gone over to America to, to to become a wrestler. And I've walked in 
to one of the biggest wrestling companies in the world in quite a privileged position. And 100%, people look at me and go, he doesn't deserve to be here. Like, you know, I've, I've been busting my ass as a wrestler for years and I haven't got the opportunity that he's got. And, and I get it. I get it. But it's the fact that, like, I haven't paid my dues, or people say in the wrestling industry. But it's like, I say that, but from 12 years old, I was training my ass off. I missed out on so many things. I missed out on on a childhood to to become an Olympian and to be one of the best in the world at what I did. And it's that level of determination which doesn't just open doors for you, like, during your thing. It will carry on. And my Olympic medal that I won and my story that I had will carry on opening doors for me, hopefully, in the future uh, for, for many, many years to come. So, so yeah, I don't I forgot what question you asked yeah, me, but I couldn't no. have went off a tangent then. <laughs> no, that is, that is something I, I do want to get to later on in the episode as well. And um, you mentioned that, that driving force and that motivation <clears throat> growing up. What was the goal? What was that, that driving force being the success? For me, it was always to be um, Olympic champion, Olympic gold medalist, always. I was never fussed about... Um, my first memory, I remember being as a kid, my first memory was um, was um, watching Olympic Christie win a gold medal in Barcelona. I was three and a half years old. I don't really remember it. I remember my mum and my sisters, all older than me, um, or one younger, but she... She bullies me as much as the rest of them, so she may as well be older than me, <laughs> older than me as well. Um, they all kind of like danced around the, the, the living room um, and Liv Christie won a gold medal. And I remember like seeing him talking to the, to the TV and all the Union Jacks around the stadium. And I thought, oh, I want that. And I didn't really know exactly what he did or what it was, but I, I wanted that. And I've become obsessed by the Olympic Games. And even before I knew what sport I wanted to do, I wanted to become an Olympic champion. And um, so that was the thing that drove me. And then I started boxing when I was 12. And I thought, this is this is the thing. Because up until that point, like, there's a million things I'm not very good at. A million things I'm rubbish at, actually. But luckily, thankfully for me, I've always been good at sport. I've always been one of those guys that can can pick up a badminton racket and I'm pretty good or a tennis racket and I can serve really well or, or whatever and thankfully I, I did a few box sports I played football to a high level I played for my captain of my county I played for Norwich up until under 14s but when I was 12 I started boxing and I just loved it I mean it was just it just it ticked every box whereas football and other sports ticked most of the boxes boxing for me ticked every box and and thankfully, I was good at it, and I pursued it. And yeah, the dream was always to become Olympic champion. And um, a lot of kids, a lot, a lot, a lot of young boxers, when they start boxing, they want to become the next Joe Calzaghe, the next pff, Lennox Lewis, next whoever, um, and become, next Vicky Hatton, and win titles as, as a professional boxer. That wasn't really. I wasn't that fussed by that. I mean. That was always probably going to happen. Had I won, become Olympic champion, because that's the general um, rule of thumb. You could, you do the Olympics, you do well, you, you turn pro. But I was never fussed about the world titles. I was always fussed about the Olympic gold medal, and that was the driving force that made me, you know, as I said earlier, sacrifice somewhat of a childhood to be to be a boxer. Yeah, that's some um, something that that fascinates me. Is is you mentioned like that was your one goal was to be to be an Olympic champion, and I'm. You hear about it a lot in sports, so I wanted to know what were the what was the feeling like post Olympics when you when you ticked off that goal? Because a lot of successful people talk about that there's maybe an empty feeling when you achieve a, something that you've chased your entire life, or you know may, maybe the goalpost shifts a bit and you're left with you know you you've you've wanted it your entire life, you've got it, and now what? What what is the motivation then? Like what was that feeling like? Yeah, so for me, my so as I mentioned earlier at the top, I mean my career amateur and pro career has been blighted by adversity both personal professional and so for me i i, I never I, I never achieved it. i never got my gold medal at the olympics which i i believe i deserved and, and should have got i am um, so the year before the olympics i dislocated my right shoulder and i had to condense um a 12, 10 month recovery to five months to get to the second qualifier, I went to the qualifier. I qualified in um, in some quite tremendous fights. When I was fought with one arm, I fought one fight. My arm was hanging out of the socket. I could even block with my arm, and I managed to win that fight. And long story short, and I overturned a six point deficit in one of my fights to qualify 
in and add a bit of context, nobody in the previous four year Olympic cycle had ever overturned a three point deficit going to the last round. A four point was unimaginable, five points is impossible. I was six points down. I had three minutes to, to go and I somehow overturned this three point uh, sorry, the six point deficit. And I qualified and I'd finally got there after after the most torrid up and down, topsy turvy um twelve month period. I'd finally qualified for the Olympic Games and then six weeks before the Olympic Games, my mum suffered a brain aneurysm from nowhere and looked like she was gonna die. And um and it's she to I'll just ruin the story straight away by saying she didn't die, but it was um, it was miraculous. I've been with her in numerous appointments and doctors have said to me and my mum, you know it's a miracle you're alive. The bleed you had on the back of your brain should have killed you instantly. And she survived. At the time, it looked like she was going to die. She was not. In a, she was in a coma throughout the whole Olympic. She would have operations on her brain throughout the whole Olympic to save her life. Um, I didn't do a thing for four weeks. Didn't throw a punch. Didn't do a press up. I went. Um, my first. I had one week of training. We trained up in the Great Britain, the Great Britain team. Trained up in Sheffield. Trains up in Sheffield. I had one week of training up in Sheffield with a team. My first day back training after after not training for four weeks. I sparred, I threw a sloppy jab, the, th- the first punch I'd thrown in four weeks. The bloke I sparred slipped out and threw a right hook to my body and he broke my rib. So I'm sitting there on the edge of that ring apron after that spar. I had a broken rib, I had damaged, a, I had torn Achilles tendons, which were like partially torn both sides, which would take, which would take four operations later on to, to fix. My shoulder was still buggered from the operation because I had to rehab it so quick, it wasn't fully functioning. My rib was broken, and I thought my mum was going to die. I thought, and, and the Olympics were in ten days, and I thought this isn't how it was meant to be. Like this isn't how I thought it was going to go when I was a kid dreaming about the Olympic Games. And then I had a really tough draw. Um, I fought the world champion who hadn't been beaten in two years' time. In, in two years, I beat him. Um, had a real, real tough, tough draw, and eventually won a bronze medal, which I was gutted about because the three guys I beat. The three guys I beat in the Olympics, including the world champ who hadn't lost in two years, had all beaten the guy that beat me in the semi-final that Olympic year. So in the previous eight months, they'd all beaten him and I'd lost to him. But I'd lost to him because I was just knackered. I, I mean, I was a fuck. I had nothing left. No energy left. No strength left. I'd missed so much training. I was worried my mum was going to die every second of the day because she was still in a coma and it was still t- t- touch and go if she was going to live or not. It was just the worst time in my life. So I couldn't, so for me personally, I couldn't, it's weird because I said I got it. There's one thing I'd ever kind of like worked my entire life for. And then when it happened, I didn't want it to happen. I wanted to, like, current climate, I wanted to postpone it for a year. You know, but obviously the Olympics weren't going to move for me and what was going on in my life at the time. So, so when I finished it, so I answered a bit of background. So I answered your question. Like I got a bronze medal, and I and I, I deserve more. I was more than good enough to get the gold medal. I'd be the best person there, and and the fact I did it was really hard. It was hard to accept because I know I I didn't achieve a lifelong ambition, which was which was devastating. Um, so what I did, I. I, I couldn't, I didn't want to wait around for four more years and do it all again because I, again, at this time, I didn't know if my mum was going to survive or not. And I, what I'd done, I'd encapsulated all my mum's, my mum's illness with the Olympic Games. And I didn't want to go for four more years to go through that cycle again and, and bring back all those bad memories, whether she was going to li- live or not. So I thought I'm going to turn pro. I'm going to turn pro. I'm going to leave this, leave this chapter in the past. I'm going, to, I'm going to turn pro and I'm going to, this time, I'm definitely going to get to the top. I'm definitely going to become the undisputed middleweight champion of the world. And that was the plan. So so what I did, as you mentioned earlier, I, I kind of changed my focus. So my, my goalposts moved when I when I had achieved something which which was obviously a, as a, an, an amazing feat, winning a medal at the Olympic Games, even more so when you, when you know stuff had kind of gone through along the way. But yeah, I, I moved the goalposts because I wasn't, I wasn't fully satisfied with the bronze medal. And I thought, to, I'm now. I now need to go and win loads of belts as a professional boxer, and yeah. Then I I, I changed my my focus from the Olympics to to the pro ranks and the world title. Would you say that even though you didn't 
um, achieve that goal that you know set in audacious goals is still a good thing because like is that quote is if you shoot for the moon you'll at least land somewhere among the stars right so would you would you say that goal setting is still an important thing even if it's not even if you don't achieve it then 100% 100% yeah 100% um because because what's the point in living if you haven't got something to chase you know what's the point in living if you're not if you're not working towards something like waking up every single day and every single day is the same the groundhog day that to me is hell that was I'd, I'd hate that having nothing to pursue i would hate that and i think and and I'll, i learned someone told me this recently very recently someone said to me literally like two weeks ago someone said to me people are happiest chasing a goal you know people are more happy chasing a goal than they are when they attain it yeah. and i was like Mm, that's really powerful. It's 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 the it's the waking up and going after something. And when you get it, I've heard, I've got mates. I've got and I never won a world title as a pro because my pro career was cut short through injury, and there was there was a bigger nightmare than, than my amateur career and my pro career. Um, I've got friends that were in the same boat, similar boats to me. We we trained together on the England team. It's it's fourteen year olds, GB team is eighteen year olds, and we all kind of went off in our separate ways. I've got friends that were extremely successful, earned millions of pounds, became world champ, and they're still not that happy, and there's still something missing. And and when I was trying to get back in the ring um, after suffering a bad eye injury, I was I had, I had all of these operations on my eye to get back in the ring. One of my friends said to me, who'd, who'd done it, who'd achieved his dream, won the world title, earned millions of pounds. He went to me, mate, he went, don't do it. It's not worth it. Trust me, I've been there. I've done it. I've achieved it. It's not worth it. I was like, wow, you know, so it was the journey. It was the journey that was better than the destination. So, yeah, in, in answer to your question, I 100% think it's better. It's good to keep, to, to set goals. And they haven't got to be that outlandish. Like, <clears throat> I set Olympic gold and, and, and world title as a pro because that's what my talents, that's what my talents, I, I was, <laughs> I was talented enough to do that. And if I had a, been dealt a better card of ha- a better hand of cards I would have um, I possibly could have done that so no point saying you know go and set these goals and that they're, they're just totally unachievable but you want to you want to set goals that that push you and that take you out of your comfort zone and yeah then just the the important thing is something that I didn't realize during my boxing career the important thing is to have fun along the way whilst you're trying to attain them and if you're not having fun, then there's there's no point. There's no point doing it. But um, that, I think that's the secret. Have a big goal, work towards it, but try to enjoy the journey as much of a destination. So <clears throat> you turn pro, and you'd put all that behind you. You put you know your extensive amateur record and an an Olympian, and now you've you've moved to pro. You're back to zero. You know your record's back to zero. You're the you're the small fish in the big pond again. What did it feel like? moving those goalposts and starting out as the underdog again, having that hunger. I loved it. It was nice. It was nice to start something new. It was nice. It was, it was, nice. It was good. It was, uh, I like people kind of writing me off. I like people, I like being an underdog. Who doesn't, you know? I like, I like being the underdog in trying to upset the apple car. I think the pressure's off from being the underdog. No one expects anything from you. Um, it's harder when people expect you to win because you can have a really, really tough fight and people go, well, oh, but he was going to win anyway or he was going to be successful anyway. You don't get as much of the credit. It's nice being the underdog. So I liked it. Turn on pro, it was, it, it was enjoyable. It was difficult because I'd gone from an Olympic setup where it was so professional. Um, even though amateur bo- even though it was amateur boxing, the GB setup is so professional. Like everything is done for you. Everything. I get it's just everything's done for you. Your only job is to turn up, train, train hard and win medals. Which I loved. Like everything is catered towards you being successful. The when you turn professional, I, I in, in the UK anyway, I, I always say like professional boxing is the least professional sport out there. It's, it's, it's not professional whatsoever. And people watch it on fight night and all the glitz and the glamour and, and TV cameras, and it looks great. That is the only glitzy thing about pro boxing. Everything else is so unprofessional. And that 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 and if you turn pro and you turn pro for millions of pounds, and you've got a massive organisation behind you backing you, then it's easy because they 
put things in place for you. When you don't have that kind of support, it's difficult because you've got to do it yourself. You've got to take it. Like, I remember when I turned pro, I had to, I didn't have the money to, I couldn't, my coach who started training me when I was a pro, he also trained a host of other professional players plus the Great Britain team. He was getting paid good money from the Great Britain team and good money from his other pro fighters. I wasn't on good money, so I was the last of his priorities, unfortunately. And then and, and it's a shame it worked out like that, but I was like, he was getting 10% of not a lot from me, where he was getting 10% from a lot more from other people. So obviously, financially, he's got to support his family and stuff. Like, he, it's not particularly fair, but he prioritized his money where, where, where the money came from and it's a shame because I and also my physio I had to kind of get a physio early on in my career and I had a few injuries as I mentioned on the Great Britain team and they kind of like chewed me up and spat me out and I, did, I, I turned pro with a few injuries which they really should have fixed before I turned pro but they they, they wouldn't because I knew they, they knew I wasn't going to fight for them anymore so I didn't really bother um, and I had to go and find a physio to, to basically treat like give me treatment once or twice a week for very little or no money, which was hard because, you know, so it was difficult turning pro. Uh, they had a lot of difficulties, but um, it was, it was, it was good. It, it was fun. It was exciting. It was, it, it was nice starting. I'm the kind of person that likes starting new things. And like, I was one of, if not the best amateur boxer in the world in 2012. And I was then starting a whole new thing as a professional fighter. I had to prove myself again, and I like having to have to prove yourself again. You know, it's, it's, it's a nice environment to be in. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned you know your career <clears throat> has this, has its roadblocks uh, in it, and um, one of those that springs to mind is you know you you were in you were making making way in your professional career, and you were stopped with that Achilles. Was there an Achilles Achilles injury? That yeah, off so I, yeah, so I had an Achilles injury from 2010, and and it got misdiagnosed whilst I was on the Great Britain team, and and they didn't really give me the night. In, in, I mean, in hindsight, in hindsight, they didn't give me the right treatment. And and then, you know, then I hurt my shoulder, which was much bigger, because my Achilles was, was was bad, but I was able to kind of get through it. Then I had a shoulder problem, and I was out. And really, I should have got the Achilles done then, but they wanted to get me back for the Olympics because I was, I was a medal, medal hopeful, and it was all about the shoulder. Then I, on a term pro, I had these bad Achilles where... They were just in a really bad way. I mean, I should have said I should have got fixed before, but I ended up having, I ended up, I didn't want the surgery on him because the surgery would have kept me out for a year, year, 18 months. Um, so I tried these like injections and different stuff, and I was out for two months at a time, three months at a time to see if like a non surgical approach would work. And unfortunately, after six months out, it, it, it didn't, I've, I've tried different stuff, it didn't work. I then got a surgery done, um, that went wrong. Uh, on both it's on, on both sides on both Achilles as well it went wrong the, the initial surgery went wrong and not only did he not fix it the bloke put an infection in both of my Achilles so I then went back into both Achilles and had to have a whole Achilles stripping so basically the, the way he explained it to me was let's say you've Basically, your, your Achilles are a piece of wood and your Achilles have got really splintered and, and horrible and gnarly and nasty. We're going to go in there and just shave them all down to the begin, all down to the bottom again because the previous operation, I'd, kind of, I'd rehabbed all this soft tissue and all this muscle, but I was infected. So all that infected tissue had to get kind of cut away and washed away. So, yeah, so the first, I was out for a few months. Then the first surgery was out for six months. Then I had another surgery and they said, he said I'd have been out for another 12 months, but I rehabbed it real quick and I got back in six months. So all, all together, I was out for 12 months, from fight to fight, out for 12 months. My first fight back, I fought over in Germany. I fought a little Ukrainian. In round two, I punched him so hard in the right hand, it skimmed off his head, and then I dislocated my shoulder again, the same shoulder I dislocated um, just before the Olympic Games. So I'm now fighting this fight again, another fight, my third fight in my career. I'm fighting with one arm, and I boxed him, and I beat him. Um, then I had the surgery done to my right shoulder to fix it, and it was a second child surgery on that shoulder, so it was already messed up. And then during the surgery, the, the surgeon accidentally nicked one of the nerves, so my arm withered away to the size of a six-year-old's arm, like generally a tiny to six. And then it took me, it took me ten months. I should have been. I was still rehabbing. Took me. I fought again ten and a half months later, 
really, I should have been about 13, 14 months because my right arm is still really skinny. And if you watch my fights from two, early 2016, my right arm is half the size of my left arm. But I had the money. And as a professional boxer, you only get paid when you fight. And I'd had 12 months off of my Achilles before. And then another 10 months off from my shoulder. I couldn't afford to not fight anymore. So I had three fights and my arm is really skinny, um, which, is really, which is really frustrating. But um, yeah, and then I got back in. I got back in the ring um, after those 10 months. I had three fights, won them all. And then I fought for the WBC International Middleweight title. And um, oh, hang on, man. I'll just demand. Hang on. Yeah. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. So I just got a delivery at the door. <laughs> so, so, so about this. Um, oh, lockdown life. Can't go out for anything. Everything's got to get the, delivered. Um, yeah, then I uh, had three fights, knocked them all out. And then I was fourth for WBC International Middleweight title, which would have given me a top 10 ranking with WBC, which would have, would have meant that I could have fought Sal Canelo Alvarez for the world title uh, in my next fight or the fight after that. And we were both promoted by the same both promoted by Golden Boy, so it was an easy fight to make, and my manager was already talking to Golden Boy about making the fight, so um, big fight for me, and then I fractured my eye socket in the build-up to that fight. That got misdiagnosed. I was told to carry on boxing because it wouldn't get any worse. I carried on boxing, it was the worst advice, from the, from the best hospital in the world for eyes, apparently. And then I boxed. Um, before the fight, I had one fracture in my eye socket, after the fight, I had eight fractures in my eye socket. My eye socket imploded, and my eye was damaged because I was getting whacked in the eye. Um, on down, down, the eye socket protects the eyeball, more the muscles around it. If the eye socket is shattered, then, then your eyes get whacked for, for, for eight rounds, and it's getting damaged and irreparable damage. And then, yeah, I had, I had nine, I had nine surgeries over three years on my eyes. To try to get me back in the boxing ring, and that wasn't to be, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, I had to retire this time last year, which was devastating. But, uh, yeah, man, that's <laughs> that's yeah, kind of my career in, in a nutshell, my pro career, anyway. And, yeah, and I, I do want to get to, to the retirement, but I mean, even when you were an active fighter uh, and you and you had you know long lay, layoffs, what was it, what's it like mentally to, to, to sit on the sidelines and you know watch everyone else in, in your division? You know, carry on fight, and you you can't do anything but sit there. You can't improve as a fighter. You just have to sit there and, and rehab. Where does that take you, man? They must take you to some dark places. Yeah, hardest thing in the world. Hardest thing in the world I've ever experienced. Um, yeah, I mean, fighting, leaving my family at the Olympic Games when they were with my mum in the hospital was the hardest thing I'd done. But that was I was away for a month, three and a half weeks. And even then, I, just, I snuck out of the Olympic Games twice to go up to Cambridge to see my mum in hospital. I did that twice. Um, but, yeah, sitting on the sidelines and watching your peers, some people you like, some you don't like, some people you've beaten before, people that you know you're better than. Watch, it's, it's been, been, been the eye thing. When I was out for three years, always hoping I was going to fight again. But, you know, always hoping I would, always believing I would. But still knowing, I was you know, still knowing that you know, realistically, I, there's a large chance I may I may not sitting on the sidelines watching people become world champion and live out my dream and earn millions of pounds when I knew I was better than them. They couldn't lace my gloves. Like that, that was that was that was hard, really hard. And watching people that, yeah, oh, that I know I'm better than. Deep down, they know I'm better than them. Win, win world titles and, and become millionaires. And I'm at home. My left eyes, I'm half blind in my left eye. My eyes don't work together. Um, my eyes look unsightly because my left eye is totally droopy because of a missed, of a, a of a wrong operation and a missed, missed diagnosis. Um, and I think how's how's again going back to what I said earlier. I used to think how was this, how is this fair? Like this was a part of the plan this was never part of the plan and why am i not well champ why am i not why am i not living out my dream right now why am i driving a car which is 25 years old <clears throat> which every time i turn it on every time i start up i pray that it starts up because i'm skin 
and I got, and then I can't afford anything better, and I don't know when I'm going to pay it again. And I've spent loads of money on operations in America already. So, how how is this the case? And all these people that I'm like, I look up, used to look up to me on the Great Britain team and ask me for advice. They're now multi-millionaires flying around in private jets. What? Or flying first class. How's, how's, how's that happening? But um, yeah, mate. So real real tough, man. Really tough. Like, was, that was the hardest part. The hardest part of being an athlete. And I had it I had it worse than most. But the hardest part of being an athlete is is, is the injuries and sitting there and, 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 and watching the world go by and you're not involved. Um, that's the toughest bit. But how important in, in those um, scenarios is is the art of resilience because you know you a lot of people in that position could just say you know what fuck it I'm you know I'm out I'm not sitting here and watching it and there's no point in me coming back so I'm playing catch up but how important is it to be to be that resilient to say you know I'm not going to wallow in self-pity I'm going to come back and, and, and work even harder yeah imperative imperative and it's a must. If you want to be successful, you have to. You have to. There's no, there's no point in sulking. I sulked. I mean, I sulked. I would whinge about it. And if any, if you were in earshot, you heard my poor wife. My poor wife is him. He's heard me whinge over and over and over again and curse this person and curse that person over again. So I fell, I fell foul to it as well. But I think it doesn't get you anywhere. I learned eventually. Not eventually, I learned. I learned pretty quickly, but I, I did still like a win. I'm not gonna lie, but I learned that. Um, <clears throat> I learned that doesn't get you anywhere. Sulking and whinging, and and asking asking the heavens why this person's got all this stuff and I haven't, ain't gonna make me get it. <laughs> like it's, it's all it's gonna do is wind wind you me up, piss you off, and and eventually, if you want to get there, you got to do the work anyway. So. Why don't you save all that time and effort and energy on whinging and just do it? That's yeah. So it's being yeah, being mentally strong, being resilient is um is 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 imperative in, in times like that. And also what it does, it refocuses you, <clears throat> it refocuses you, and it reminds you. It, it reminds you, you know, do you want it? Like how bad do you want it? Like do you do you do you want it when things are going well? Because when things are going well, anybody wants it. It's easy. It's not hard. Because when things go tough, that's when you think, that's when you realise, oh, yeah, I do want it. I really, really do want it, you know. Or you, you might not want it. You might realise, you might think, actually, this isn't for me. Like, I like the idea of being a world champ or I like the idea of selling a, a million records or books or whatever. I like the idea of having a, having a company, but the reality of it, have to deal with all this shit along the way. Nah, it's not for me, really. I'm going to do something else. So it's you know good. I think it cuts the uh, you know, it cuts the wig from the strong. I think, um, yeah. I imagine that was something that was important when obviously up until this point in your in your professional career, you'd, you'd only known winning, and um, when you eventually came to your you know your only loss, um, how, how did you, how do how do you manage loss? Because I mean, just for people that not just in fighting, but I mean, like people, you know, lose every day. It's, it's, you know, it's an important part of success. But how did you manage your, your loss? And, and what was that like after only knowing success up to that point? Really? I mean, I, my, my loss in professional boxing, I don't, I don't, I don't class it as a loss. And that's not me being bitter um, at all. Um, you know, I, you know, at all. You know, I've, I'd, I'd lost, I lost fights as an amateur boxer. I lost my seven fight as an amateur. I lost probably about in about three hundred fights. Probably lost about twenty times, twenty five times maybe. Um, so I'd lost before, but I didn't. I I I never classed that as a loss. I never, you know, some fighters and they're on a on, on a winning spree when they lose, um, it hits them, hits them hard. And they got. I never had that feeling because I knew my eye was bad. I knew I had a real bad eye. And I wanted to fight again. Sorry, I don't want to fight again. And um, literally, when I out like that, and I'd already been to the hospital about my eye anyway because I was I was told to fight by the consultant I saw. So when I left after the fight that night, we went to a hotel and I emailed. Um, I emailed and then called at like ten past twelve on a Saturday night. The eye surgeon that gave me the advice. I wanted to kind of get in and see him straight away. So. 
second I left that ring, oh, of course, of course, I was devastated. I was devastated because that guy I wouldn't, he didn't you know, he'd, he would not have lasted five rounds of me he had had I'd, my eyes been, been okay. I mean, I, and that other frustrating thing was, I was actually, when, 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 when my corner found out something was going on in the fight, because I was boxing really badly because I couldn't see from my left eye, I had a really bad double vision. And one of my left eyes was twisted in 30 degrees. So I was seeing two people. One was down on the floor. One was up high. And the up high one was lying on the side. It was the weirdest, most horriblest, horriblest thing. I would not wish on my worst enemy. Um, and, yeah, and uh, he... So I was just saying, yeah, and I and I was still winning the fight. I was winning the fight, fight on the scorecards. When my corner got win, like in round eight, they realised my was bad, and then they threw the towel in. I was still winning the fight, which is really frustrating because if I'd have got through two more rounds, I'd have won the fight. Not would have made the eye any different, but I'd have won the fight. I wouldn't have suffered a loss in quotation marks. But um, yeah, I mean, the loss to me was a setback. It wasn't. I don't see. I'm really. This is a really bad way of explaining that. I know I'm not making myself very clear at all. Um, I've suffered losses in the past, and every single time when I've suffered a loss, I've kind of got myself back up. I've looked at. I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, when I've suffered a loss in the past, I've looked at what I've lost. Yeah. I've taken full responsibility because this is one of the reasons why um, I mentioned at the top of this phone call that boxing ticked all the white boxes for me because in football. I remember one game specifically for my county. I was captain of my county. We were 3 0 up. There's about three minutes left, and the other team scored. And we won 3 1. And when they scored, I was gutted. I was angry. I was shouting at the uh, whoever, the, the, the keeper, for whatever. And the, the keeper and the centre back weren't in communication with each other. A lad nipped in, scored the goal. And that's 3 1. I had a, I gave, I was about 13. I gave a bollock in to the, to the goalkeeper, to the centre back. And and then the, the manager said to me, and then he calmed down, we're still winning. And I looked at the manager, and I was at that moment, I thought, what the heck? Like, I want to win more than my own manager. How does that? <laughs> how, how does that? How does that? Doesn't that add up? And point I'm making is what I love about boxing is if you win, lose, or draw, it's all down to you. Like, sure, it's subjective and stuff, and sure, you need coaches and stuff, but. It's down to you. Only you're in control of how hard you train. You're in control of how much you want to learn in a particular session, how much you want to drill, what you've learned to cement into your in, into your repertoire. So, and I love that about boxing. I loved it. So what I like, when you do lose in boxing, um, when I lost the boxing, I'd always look at the fight and watch it over and over. Or if I couldn't watch the fight, because before you reached the kind of like film fight, I'd, 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 I'd shut my eyes and think about the punches I took and how much it hurt or where I got hit and why I got hit. And I'd work on it. And I'd train and train and train. And and um, quick mini story, a little segue. Like My first fight on the Great Britain team in 2010, in June, there was two years to go to the Olympic Games. I fought uh, a Dutch guy. I, beat, I just won the ABA Championships. I, won, I had five fights. I got hit once in five fights. Then my first fight at the European Championships, I boxed a Dutch guy. I beat him 7-0, so I didn't get hit. In the next fight, I fought Down O'Neill from Ireland. I lost 11-1. I'd just gone six fights and got hit once in six fights. And this guy just sprang to me 11-1. And I thought, what the heck? That that what? The, where, where did that come from? And I had two years to go to the Olympics. And Dan O'Neill was good, but he wasn't great. Like he was, he was never going to do anything. Like uh, no, in the Olympics, he was never. He wasn't that good. And I and and then I sat and watched every um, I watched every fight of the European Championships to punish myself because I could not believe I lost. And I I couldn't believe I lost, but I, didn't, I couldn't believe I lost in the way that I'd lost. And I sat and I had a little notebook and I wrote down everything, um, everyone who won, why they won, like what style they were, how many punches they threw. Um, I just wrote down everything. And then I knew if I was going to be successful in boxing, I had to do, I had to change my game or do something. And then in four, four months later, I went to the Commonwealth Games. And so basically I'd lost to a guy who was good, but wasn't great. And I, I well lost as well. Um, in a, as in Russia, in a neutral arena. And then four months later, after really, really hard training and changing my total style of boxing, I went to India and I fought Vijendra Singh, the Indian, the world number one, the best boxer in the world at the time in my weight category. And I beat him in his own country, in front of his own fans and his own judges. And that just proves that 
in four months time you if you really want something you can make it happen and that's how I deal with loss really I I I, I figure out what I lost and and, and and I tried to change it and that's why I never I felt like I'd lost it in, in, in my pro, pro career because I didn't really lose to somebody. I, I, I lost because I was blind and the referee um, threw the set and then my, my, my corner threw the towel in. And that was the frustrating thing because there's nothing I could have learned. I was in the best shape of my life going into that fight physically. From my, not, from my nose down, I was in the best shape of my life. I was, in, I was, I was extremely fit and I lost and I, I couldn't do anything about it I couldn't do anything about my eye getting fractured and getting then getting refractured and, and fractured over and over again so that was the most frustrating thing so I couldn't really take much away from that other than just keep doing what you're doing in, in many aspects really so I guess the one of the main lessons I'm taking from this is loss or, or failure you can use it as you know you, you can use it as an opportunity to learn rather than just a negative thing then you could turn that negative into a into a greater positive yeah for sure people don't and you can like you can win you you can learn from wins you can because i've done it like it just it just hits home more like when you are like i've i've, I've watched i've watched um videotape of my fights and i've won and and I've, I've watched the videotape back and i've gone oh yeah maybe i could have doubled a jab more here or maybe i could have like thrown hook there or or maybe maybe my defense is a bit leaky in in this situation, and maybe I should be a bit tighter. But you won, so it doesn't carry as much weight. But if you had that same fight and you lose that fight, then yeah, you're definitely going to tighten your defense up. You're definitely going to throw more double jabs. It just hits home much harder when you lose. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's a perfect opportunity to kind of take stock and to have a look at yourself and go, "Why well, I lost because of that? I lost because of that. Cool." Let's do this next time. Let's do that. I'm not going to lose again. So um, yeah, perfect opportunity to to take stock, really. And uh, you you already touched on um, retirement a little bit, but uh, I remember um, just how heartbroken you seemed at the time on social media, and and I saw you know some outpouring of messages from guys like Tony Jeffries, and and it was it was quite an emotional time and i could see i could see what it what it meant to you at the time and uh, i guess the hardest thing is for a fighter wants to make that that retirement decision themselves uh, rather than it being yeah. made for them so what i was wondering is like talk to me about the initial coming to terms and now that you weren't a boxer anymore did you sort of struggle with your identity because up to that point in your life that's all you've ever been yeah 100% mate mate you're asking some really good questions and you're 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 asking them in a really nice way as well, mate. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, 100% I did. And I did my wife, right, who's floating around in the kitchen. So I better be really nice about her. She's, um, she used to say to me, she went, you're more than just a boxer. Like, you're more than just a boxer. You're going to be okay. When I was struggling in my in my three-year absence from the ring, trying to get back, she, you're, more, you're going to be okay. You, 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 you're more than just a boxer. You can do anything you want to do. And I was like, yeah, but I want to box. I just, I just want to box because I still had ever done. Like, and I was quite lucky. I, I mentioned earlier, I'm so bad at so many things. I really am. Um, but I was always very lucky. I was always very lucky. I was good at sport. And the one sport I wanted to do was boxing. And that was, and that's what I'd given my life to. And I wanted to get something from it. I wanted to get something that I wanted from it. Because the Olympic bronze medal is an amazing achievement. And I do know that. But I wanted the gold medal, so I didn't get. So I look. So I used to look at my bronze medal, and still now to a degree, sometimes, in like in kind of sneer my nose up a little bit, thinking ah, it should have been the gold. Um, and then I thought, when I said, as I said earlier, I thought the pro career. This is where I will achieve it. Like I will achieve my my Mount Olympus moment, where I get exactly what I want to get. And then and then now this has been taken away from me from by something I've got no control in. It's not fair and. And I had, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd wrapped up my own identity in being a boxer. Like, I'd go to the supermarket and people, old, old blokes would say to me, oh, when you're out next, when you're boxing next. And I liked that, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah. And, so, and it became a really community, like, community thing. And, and uh, yeah, it's made it as whole, as weird, as, as weird. And had I achieved my Olympic gold medal and I could look back and went, well, do you know what? Like, anything on top of this would have been a bonus anyway. So I'm glad I've got that. But I didn't get that, so I left. I left thinking I put 18 years into this, 18 years into my career, and I spent an all. I spent a hundred thousand pounds on operations alone in America. Four surgeries, each one was a lot of money, hundred grand total. 
just surgeries. That's not flights. That's not this. And that's and I'm like, <clears throat> like people think about Tyson Fury or <clears throat> Anthony Joshua's like purse. I was never on that. I never got anywhere near that 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 kind of money. I actually spent more money on operations and stuff than I ever earned in the boxing ring. So I I put everything back into my career and I left my career. I thought I've got less money now than when I started seven years ago. How does that work? You know, but. But I'm very proud that I kind of I, I saw through to the end. You know, I saw through to the very end. Had I jacked it in after one operation or maybe two operations, I always sort of thought in the back of my head, uh, what if I'd have carried on? Like, what if I'd have, what if I'd have rolled the dice one more time? Maybe I could have been there, or maybe I could have you know, got back in the ring and become world champ. But I gave everything I had. I gave everything I had, and nothing else could have been done. And at least when I walked away, as, as heartbreaking as it was, I walked away knowing that I gave it my all. And I think that's the main thing when you. When you do, if you if if you um, if you do have to um, stop something you care about and you love, if you can stop it, knowing that you gave everything, you never shirked the tackle, you never s- swerved the training session, then and only then can you walk away going, yeah, it just wasn't meant to be because I gave it my all, and I really did so. That was the only thing I kind of. I'm quite a positive person. I want to look for the positives of in every every aspect, and that's what I took from my boxing career. I gave my all, and the fact I gave my all, like unbeknownst to me at the time, opened up other things to me. Those, those, those videos you, you mentioned a minute ago, like, oh, that was my that was my seventh surgery on my eye. Um, I was in Boston. I've been away for the best part of a month on my own. I had. The, my, my one one final hurrah like I had two smaller surgeries afterwards in the hope I'd get back boxing but after this one this is the one where I knew it wasn't it wasn't to be after this one um, so I rolled the dice and and I was at and I broke some both my eyes and went back to get to the hospital five days later and he had to when you're it's horrible the most horrible thing ever when you're awake they basically operate on your eyes when you're awake. They're the main operation when you're asleep, then they wake you up, and then they operate on you when you're awake. It's the most horrible thing. And everywhere else in the world, they do it to you immediately when you're still half like drowsy and you're both like you're still not really with it. You're under sedation still, so you can't really feel it. This bloke does it five days later when you're fully coherent. You have no, you know exactly what's going on. You can they, they, they numb your eyes with anesthetic. But you can still feel it, man. It's horrible. And he's messing around with my eyes whilst I'm awake. And the pain. And the pain was... It wasn't just the pain. It was just... It was, I just felt sick. And when I... I said, when he, he sent me home, I went back to the waiting room in Boston... There's Boston Children's Hospital. And I sat in the waiting room. I thought, I'll sit here for 10 minutes. Because kind of, I just felt ill. I felt really, really not right. And I thought, I'll get a taxi in a minute. Ended up there for three and a half hours. I could not... I just couldn't move. I was like... I was just paralyzed with just just dread and fear and worry and pain and just I felt I felt a whole nauseating feeling, and then I started doing these videos and not I, I mean I didn't even I didn't even think much about them but yeah they got picked up quite a lot and people started sharing them and saying nice things to me and stuff, and it took that thank you Casey it took that for people to realize like like it's, it's weird like. People only kind of really got it or got me after those videos because prior to that, I think people, because I'd done some TV stuff and when I was injured with a shoulder, I did Strictly Come Dancing um, and I've done other stuff as well because as I said earlier, I had no money and if, if you don't fight as a pro, you don't get paid. Um, and like, people seem to do a job TV thing and they th- I think they thought I wanted to be a celebrity more than a boxer, which could not be further from the truth. And it took me going through nine operations and doing these emotive videos after this one particular operation, people will see it and go, oh, he's actually he's actually he's actually a fighter in the truest sense of the word. He's a warrior, he, he, he wants this more than anything. And that, madly enough, endeared me to the British boxing public or public in general, more than any of my fights did, or the Olympics did. It's really weird. Um so yeah, I mean I'm, I'm talking for so long I've got a question you asked me, yeah. but uh yeah. yeah uh, perfectly, man. Um Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, you mentioned there that um, you did you did a few like TV shows and stuff, and and because you weren't getting paid at the time. But I wonder how like 
obviously they, they were really diverse. I remember obviously seeing you on Strictly Come Dance and you were on, I remember seeing you pop up on Bear Grylls, the island as well one day. Yeah, I, was, yeah, yeah. I was thinking, well, what's he, t- you know, what's he doing this? But um, is, is, is that something you like to do? Like, because you well, seem to put yourself in like a lot of like uncomfortable <laughs> environments. Yeah, well, a couple, yeah, yeah, I'll answer that in a couple of different ways. So, like you said, you know, I got a lot of that. What's he doing this for? I did a TV show, and all my TV shows I've done, all but one, have been good TV shows, like the like the their channel's best TV show, for example. Oh, yeah. BBC One, Strictly Come Dancing, they get 15 million viewers, 20 million viewers on the final. Yeah. So, like, I'm like, you, you to get asked to get asked to do that is um. Is an honor, and I didn't. And they asked me to do it three times before. Every single time, I said no. I'm boxing. No, I'm boxing. No, I'm boxing. And then they saw the week, the month before they went on live, live TV. They saw an interview on BBC Sport. Me injured from the shoulder, and I couldn't fight for however long. And they offered me a lot of money to do it. They said, "Look, you're not injured Look, now." So they said to me, "You wanted, to, you didn't want to do this because you wanted to box. Now you can't box for a long time as per this interview. Now do you want to do it?" And I was like. I've got, I've got nothing stopping me. My shoulder's buggered anyway. I might as well get paid. And also, I might as well use this time out to raise my profile in a wider wider media because you never know what happens with boxing. I actually ended up not retiring a few years later. So it was a good thing for me to do to, you know, people... Yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, the I, I did Splash on ITV1, IT Olympic Games, got paid well for that. And again, it was Saturday night, primetime TV. Why would you not want to do that to kind of, like, showcase yourself to the wider um wider wider audience demographics and also uh bell Goonels, that's like that's like channel four's biggest yeah. uh celebrity show um and it's actually really cool and that's like yeah. that's, that's a really cool experience i've done one thing which i i, I don't regret doing so i needed this i needed the money for an operation i spent i told i spent a hundred thousand pounds on surgeries on my eyes in those three years i had no money I didn't earn that in my boxing career. I earned less than that for my, for my boxing in-ring career. I didn't even earn that. Um, I had to sell my car to pay for surgeries and stuff. I did this one TV show for it. I got about 10 grand for it. As a rubbish, as like a ghost hunter thing. And that's embarrassing on Channel W. <laughs> and it was embarrassing. And I, did not, I didn't want to do it. And I did it because I had no money. And yeah. and what else was I going to do? I, I'm not going to go and rob a bank. Cause I'm, a, just, I'm a law-abiding citizen. So... I done a TV show and I got a tweet after the first after like three, I think it was two or three episodes. And after the first episode, I got a tweet saying, "Oh, a gogo must be skin. What's he doing this for?" <laughs> and my and my, my response was, "Yeah, mate, I am. I don't. I mean, I didn't know why. Well, as I said, if you're a pro boxer yeah. and you're not boxing, you are not getting paid." And when on top of that, when you have all these surgeries in different places, costing a lot of money. So, yeah. You know, regarding the Bear Girls thing, right? Um, that that was one of the best things I've ever done in my entire life, like, and I ever will do. Yeah. I got I've, there's some proper cool dudes, some proper cool dudes, right? I got the opportunity to go to Panama and live on an island, like, like, a uh, survivor for a month, and have to kind of hunt and kill and eat your own food, eat your own food. That was so cool, like. And like you're never gonna get the time to do that again ever. Like it was, it was just so cool. It was really, really cool. It was tough. I lost, I lost 44 pounds. I lost over three stone. I contracted E. coli for eating a, a dead fish. Um, it was horrible. It was tough. It was really challenging, but it was great fun. So that's something that I'm, I, I'm privileged to do because most people go to work Monday to Friday and whatever. You know, I get to do that for work, and that's the furthest. That's the furthest thing from work. You know, so um, people don't want to criticize me for that. And, and fair enough. But also, again, the whole plan was to earn money um, and keep my profile up whilst I was out of the ring for my eye injury um, before I got back in the ring. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get back in the ring. I get as many people come up to me and say, oh, man, I love John Bear Grylls, than I do say, I get more people say that to me, yeah. than I do saying, oh, you knocked out Kieran Gray in your debut, that was a great, that was a great right hand or whatever, because cause that's more mainstream, and I enjoyed it, and it's nice, you know, so I do like doing something like that, I do like testing myself, and like Strictly Come Dancing, right, I mean, if, if, if you knew me, I'm the, all, the, all that showbiz and glitz and glamour and stuff, that's, it's not really a bit of me, I'd, I'd rather been in the ring punching somebody's head in, 
on a Saturday night, but unfortunately I was injured, so I couldn't. But t- like dancing, I can't, I can't dance at all. But dancing in live in front of ten million people on a Saturday night, well out of your comfort zone on BBC One, yeah. mate, that's cool. Like that is really cool. That's um, it's a really cool, <laughs> it's a really cool thing. And I mentioned to you earlier in one of the answers, I said to you that like. I like being the underdog and I like learning, like starting again and learning new stuff. For for six weeks, I was a professional dancer, training eight on eight hours a day. That was brilliant. I mean, I, mean, I was I, mean, I wasn't very good at it, but I learned a new skill for I mean, I've gone all now. I can't dance now, but I learned. I couldn't dance then. That's why I left after week three. But I um I learned a little bit and I, I challenged myself and I danced on BBC One on ten million people. So it was it was a laugh, you know. It was good fun, and I I, I don't regret it because. It was cool. It was it was a nice thing to do. And and how many people at the age of thirty one can say they've done half the stuff I've done in my life? You know, not not many. So I do feel very privileged. And uh, although I've had a few, you know, downs along the way, I have lived a very very fortunate life. Yeah, man. I, I thought I, I'm I, I'm glad you did. I mean, I I thought Bit the Bear Grill Show painted you in, in a in a fantastic light for your profile and. And obviously, you know, like strictly, I mean, I was talking to my girlfriend last night. I said I had an interview today and I mentioned it was a boxing. She knows nothing about boxing. And <laughs> so I was like, I'm not going to tell you who it is because you're not going to know. And she was like, oh, yeah, go on. And I was like, well, Anthony, go, go. And she's like, yeah. Um, that was uh, OD's partner on Strictly. And like, see, That's what I yeah. Her first year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, man. So, you know, before we start. And also, life, mate. On, oh, on, carry on, yeah. sorry, on, on that one as well. The reason why I like doing that stuff because... Like, boxers, we don't get... Like, in boxing, you do get some dickheads. Like, anywhere. There's some dickheads in boxing, dickheads in football, dickheads in, in politics, whatever. But you get some nice people. Unfortunately, in boxing, it's the dickheads that get a lot of, lot of the attention, a lot of media spotlight. So, because of that, because people are a bit stupid and they, they believe what they read or believe what they see all the time, and, and why wouldn't they? Boxers oftentimes don't get the best, like... Reputation, best rap in certain stuff. I like doing when I was a boxer. I like doing certain things as a boxer. So I used to think that I was representing boxing as well. I want to come across as a nice guy because there are plenty of nice guys in boxing, and I felt a duty to to portray myself and the sport of boxing in the best way possible. So another reason why I like doing that stuff. So people would always, crit- and then you get those idiot boxing fans would, would criticise me during doing this stuff. But I can get this because I'm out here having a good time, earning a few quid, um, and making making lifelong memories and making friends doing something which is better than what you're doing, whatever you're doing, you know. So yeah, I don't regret any of my TV stuff. So I, I do actually, I really enjoy it. I mean. Before we start to wind down now, I wanted to, um, I mean, we, we touched on it briefly, but, you know, obviously now you're retired and, and the goalposts have shifted again. Um, you've signed with AEW um, and I don't think people realise what a massive promotion that is. I mean, you've got likes of you got Chris Jericho and Cody Rhodes and people like that. You know, there's a massive deal. Um, and how, how is that now? You know, because you're learning something from scratch. How does it feel to be the student again? It... Um... Oh, it feels it's 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 hard. It's hard. It is hard, man. It's it's tough. But again, that's that's what I like about it. I like the challenge of starting again, of being the novice and, and learning again. It's, it's, it's <clears throat> when you get good at something, um, as I was at boxing, you don't really learn new things. And like I, unfortunately, I, I joined. I, I got an amazing new coach when I when I hurt my eye. I got a new coach, and again, I always thought I was gonna box again and I thought me and him were going to have a long career training and, and fighting with each other unfortunately I never got back in the ring um, but when I even when I got to him I was 28, 29 and like I, he, he couldn't really teach me new stuff so like sure he could put together new combinations or he could work on like new like, little little nuances and you can fine tune things but I already, I already knew how to box so I had my style so I didn't really learn much like really you know so sometimes you can kind of come away thinking I didn't learn a lot today. You kind of just go going over the same stuff. Whereas in this, I'm now in a real cool position because I go to the Western school every single day. Not now, because obviously under lockdown. But when I was, I was going every single day and I was learning six new things a day. And it was brilliant. And every day I'd drive away from 
come back home with a massive smile on my face thinking I've learned that today that's really cool so I'm, I'm learning loads and obviously that'll plateau eventually as I kind of get better and learn more but it's just really cool being in the position to learn stuff it's really it's, it's, it makes you feel good it makes you it makes you really cool uh, good about yourself although it's very challenging and I'm 31 I've got a lot of miles on the clock already from an 18 year boxing career and a few aches and pains I've had 19 surgeries in my life already so <laughs> and I've I've taken a few bumps already along the road and I'm now doing wrestling, which is extremely physical and extremely physically demanding. Um, but it's cool. It is cool. And it's a really big deal because I had an offer from... I mean, AEW is a big deal, I mean, because I had an offer from WWE to go there, the biggest company in the world. And I chose I chose AEW over WWE um, because I believe in what they're doing and I think it's going to be really cool. And, um, and yeah, and so far they've... They've maybe think I've picked the right the right place. They've put some great TV shows on. They're on ITV over here in the UK. So fingers crossed, my profile will continue to rise, and will be in a different, uh, somewhat different demographic over the next four, five, six years, however long I want to wrestle for. And yeah, then after that, I'll look to do something else new, um, I guess. But up until that time, I'm gonna, as we mentioned at the top of this phone call, um, I had all that determination around amateur boxing and become an Olympic gold medal and I got almost there but I didn't quite get it because of other stuff and then I turned pro and I shifted that attention to the pro career and I always I thought I was going to get there and that got cut short because of the eye and what I've done I've, I've repackaged all that drive and determination I've got and I'm now channeling it towards professional wrestling and I hope I get that thing I'm searching for I hope I get it from professional wrestling and that's that's what I'm working towards each day I love that man, and I you know I, I just love to see, you know, you you not you're not taking the the easy route. You're, you're trying something new. You're trying a new challenge, and uh, I think that's really inspiring. Thank you, mate. I really, I do, I do really, I really appreciate that. I mean, because I, I had some nice offers, some nice, some really, some some quite nice offers to sit behind a commentary table and talk about boxing, and yeah. and that would have been really easy because um, I I know boxing. And I can talk, so I mean, like, it's you know, it's um, as you as you found out for the last hour. But I, um, <laughs> it would have been easy for me to do that, but it had been hard for me because I'd have been sitting there watching and talking about and pretending to be happy about people, as I said earlier, like living out my my dream, and that would have been hard for me. But I'm sure, again, they're paying me enough money. They would have paid me enough money to to deal with it, <laughs> but that'd have been easy for me. And what would I learn? And I'd have been a commentator for the rest of my life. And I thought whilst I'm still young and whilst I've still got this drive inside me and, and this ambition to be successful and whilst I'm still physically able to do so, why don't I try something that's really cool? And I mean, when I was a kid, I used to watch The Rock and Stone Cold with Steve Austin and The Undertaker wrestle. And I mean, any, I was about 10, 11 at the time, any, kid then watching wrestling you can't tell me you didn't want to be the rock i mean who doesn't want to be the rock so <laughs> exactly. i've i've now got a chance to try and be the rock so it's uh that to me is way more fun um than sitting behind the commentary table or going out and getting a real going out i just don't want to get a real job i'm trying my best to not <laughs> have to ever get a real job that's pretty much what i'm doing i think love it man. so uh, the last question i have for you is is we ask every guest <clears throat> if you could um distill all the the life lessons and experiences you've had and you had an opportunity to to broadcast a lesson or a message to everyone in the world what would what would your main lesson or what would your main message to everyone be yeah uh no well, good question i like that for, so for me um it's something i'm trying to do now which i didn't do in my boxing career like I mean, we've kind of touched upon it already in this conversation but i just want to kind of like like I say it in bold so my biggest regret and mistake I made in boxing was I was so keen to get there I was so keen to become world champion because of the injuries I was I was I was waiting I felt like my career was on hold and I had to kind of like catch up I was so keen so keen to get there and get to the end get to the end of the race that I totally ignored the journey i didn't appreciate the steps along the way i didn't like I remember my debut my debut fight my, my pro debut boxed up in sheffield in front of ten thousand people I had loads of friends jumped on a bus a couple of buses to come watch me and we we hired and uh, my team had hired out a, <clears throat> a nightclub 
a little area in my club to kind of celebrate afterwards. But I boxed three weeks later in New York, and I I've, I knocked the guy out in round two. A fantastic performance, if I do say so myself, <laughs> or, or lucky punch, whatever you want to call it. And I um, and then I and then I, I I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to go and celebrate with my, with my friends and my family because I wanted I was so focused on the next fight, the next fight, the next fight. So as my there, I'm never ever gonna get back. I missed out a cracking night with my friends. Apparently they had a really nice night. Now I didn't have to drink. I could have just went there for a few hours and showed my face and smiled and had a laugh and had a little dance, but I didn't. I chose to go back to my hotel room and, and, and go to bed at ten PM or whatever it was. The point I'm making is now when you climb a when you climb a when you climb Mount Everest or when you climb a, a mountain, everyone wants to see the view from the top. And some don't get there for whatever reason. Maybe it's too slippy or whatever. I don't know. So someone said to me a long time ago, what, like, sometimes, oftentimes, the view from halfway up the mountain can be just as nice as the view from the top. And now you're not choosing that view instead of the top view. You just have a look along the way. So it's not. It's nice to kind of stop sometimes, have a look around, take it all in, and then continue your pursuit to the top. And I guess what I'm saying is it's nice to... It's nice to enjoy the moments along the way as well as the defining, crowning moment. And that's something I didn't do in my boxing career. And unfortunately, I missed out. I still had some amazing times, don't get me wrong. But unfortunately, I missed out on a lot of moments along my career, my boxing career, which I could have enjoyed along the way. So if I've got any advice for people, it's, yeah, work hard and be determined and be driven and, and want to achieve this amazing goal that you've set out, you know, as a kid or whenever you set the goal, but don't be afraid to take stock along the way, turn around, look at the view whilst you're climbing the mountain. You know, I've asked that question almost a hundred times so far. And that's, that's probably one of my favorite answers. I, I love that, man. That was, that was great. Oh, cheers, mate. Thank you. Uh, where can our, our audience find you on, um, on social media? Mate? So, uh, Twitter at Anthony Ogogo, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-O-G-O-G-O, and Instagram at Anthony Ogogo 11, same Anthony Ogogo, one one at the end. Um, yeah, and also I'm doing different stuff as well. I mean, like I'm now in the midst of this. I've been creating a, a fitness app for a while, actually, and the people I've been doing it with somebody and this kind of stagnated the last like six months or so and because of this this lockdown this this thing we're in at the moment everyone's stuck at home so I'm, I've just pumped a load of money of my own money into this thing to kind of get up and running now so people can stay fit whilst they're trapped at, at home so keep your eyes out for that I always do some some fitness things on Instagram as well you know I'm, I'm, I care about people I care about people's like health and say um their health and well-being but on top of that because of the things we spoke about earlier i care about people's mental state as well and i think that like fitness is the perfect thing for physical and mental uh well-being you know so keep your eyes out for uh, some training stuff i'll be dropping later and and my little fitness app that i'll be releasing in the next month or so as well so yeah that's where you can catch me i'll uh we'll link all of that and uh in the description below the podcast so everyone can just click straight there um mate thank you for your time i've 